The application of this lab is vulnerable to a TECL attack and will first detect a TECL vulnerability by using a timing technique. And for the timing technique, we're using these two payloads here, where first we're sending this request, where if the front end rejects our request, that confirms that the front end is using transfer encoding chunked. At this point, we don't know what the back end is using yet. That's why we have the second request here. If we send that request and the request times out and we get back a timeout error from the back end, then that confirms that the back end is using content length. And it's a very strong indication that this lab or this endpoint we're targeting is vulnerable to a TECL attack. Now, the reason this timing technique works is because when we send the first request, when it arrives at the front end server, if the front end server is using transfer encoding chunked, it will read in a chunk size of three, ABC, followed by the next chunk size X, which is an invalid chunk size. So the front end server will simply reject our request and respond with an invalid request error. And that shows us that the front end server might be using transfer encoding chunked. Then when we follow that up with the second request, when that arrives at the front end server, because it's using transfer encoding chunked, we sent an X here after the terminating chunk, but because it's using, the front end is using transfer encoding chunked, it will drop off that X because it thinks that the request has ended after the terminating chunk, and then forward on the request to the backend server. The backend server in turn, if it's using content length, and we set a content length of six, but the body at this point only includes five bytes. So one, two, three, four, five, five bytes of content because of the dropped X here. So the backend server will be waiting for byte number six to come in until the backend server decides to timeout our request. So if we get back a timeout error for this request, then that confirms to us, or it's a very strong indication that this endpoint is vulnerable to a TECL attack. Now, all we have to do to confirm that TECL vulnerability is by using differential responses. And a differential response is simply a pair of requests, an attack request and a normal request, where if we send this attack request to the front end server, the front end server is using transfer encoding chunked. And we want the front end server to forward our entire body here, which contains our smuggled request for a resource that doesn't exist. We want it to forward that entire request onto the backend server. That's why we set the terminating chunk at the very end, because that ensures that the entire request body is forwarded onwards. You can also see that there's the first chunk size here, A5 followed by the carriage return line feed. That includes everything from post up to and including X equals one. So anything before the next chunk size, basically. So this is the next chunk size. In this case, it's the terminating chunk, but it doesn't include the carriage return line feed before. So anything from post up to and including X equals one, the hexadecimal size for that is A5 followed by the carriage return line feed. I'll go through when we work through the lab, how you can easily see this through burp. Then this request is forwarded on to the backend server. The backend server is using content length and we've set a content length of four. So the backend server thinks that the request has ended right here after the first chunk size, A5 followed by the carriage return line feed. Then it's poisoned by this prefix here, the request that we smuggled in. So the post request for the resource that doesn't exist. And it's sitting now on the buffer, that prefix of the backend server. And we've also set a content length of 15 here in the smuggled request. And that is actually less because the content size here in the request body is 10 bytes. So the backend server, when it reads this uh, prefix in, it's still waiting for five bytes of content to come in before it would execute this request. That's why we follow it up the normal, the attack request with our normal request here, which is just a very simple get request for the front page, gets forwarded on to the front end server, the front end server forwards it on to the backend server. And because the backend server is poisoned by this prefix and it's waiting for five more bytes to come in, this content is appended right after our body here. So only five bytes of our uh, normal request are actually appended to the prefix here. So the get, the space, and then the slash. And the rest of the request is still sitting on the buffer of the backend server at this point, or it's discarded by the backend server. It kind of depends on the implementation. So. Normally for this normal request, because it's a get request for the front page, we'd expect to get back a 200 okay. But because it's executing a post request for uh, a resource that doesn't exist, we get back a 404 not found. And the 404 response differs. That's why it's called a differential response. It differs from the 200 okay that we'd normally expect to see. And that confirms that this endpoint is vulnerable to a TECL attack. So now let's see what that looks like in the lab. I'm gonna switch to burp and then go to proxy and HTTP history. And I'm gonna grab the get slash request for the root endpoint here and send it to repeater, switch to repeater. 
The first thing you want to do, you can see here on line one that we're using HTTP2. You want to go to the inspector window on the right under request attributes and downgrade that to HTTP 1.1. And next thing we're going to do is change the request method to post. And then I'm also going to show new lines or carriage return line feeds. That's always handy when you're doing request smuggling. I'm also going to clean up some of the request headers here. So anything above content type and underneath the host header, it's not absolutely necessary, but it makes things a bit easier to follow along. I'm going to add it to width here as well. And then under the request settings, I'm going to turn off update content length automatically because for the timing techniques, we want to be able to control that ourselves because we're going to set it to a value of six. And then on the next line, we're going to set a request header transfer encoding for a value of chunked. You want to make sure that there's a carriage return line feed uh, below your request headers to separate it from the request body. And in the request body, we're setting a chunk size of three, ABC, followed by the invalid chunk size X, followed by a new line. And when we send this request, we immediately get back a 400 bad request or invalid request. And that's the response that we get from the front end server, because it's a strong indication that it's using transfer encoding chunked because it is reading in a chunk size of three, ABC. It's then reading in the next chunk size X, which is an invalid chunk size. And that's why the front end is rejecting our request. Now let's find out what the backend server is using. So I'm going to delete the payload that we had here in the request body before. And then I'm going to set a terminating chunk. So the zero followed by the two carriage return line feeds, and then the letter X, but not followed by a carriage return line feed. We're going to leave the content length at six, and then send this request. And you can see the response is already taking a long time to get back and eventually it'll time out. And that's because when we send this request, the front end server is using transfer encoding chunked, it thinks that the request has ended here after the terminating chunk, it will actually drop the X because of that. That means that we have, if you if I select this here, one, two, three, four, five, five bytes of content, as you can see here, we're in the selection window. And we have set a content length of six. So when this arrives, this content arrives of five bytes at the backend server, which is using content length, it's waiting for that six byte to come in. And because it doesn't, we get a communication timeout. So we get uh, this error right here. And that through the timing techniques confirms to us or it's a very strong indication that this endpoint we're targeting is vulnerable to a TECL attack. So now let's confirm the TECL vulnerability by using differential responses. So what we want to do is we want to turn this request into our attack request. So I'm going to rename this tab to attack request. And then I'm going to delete what we had in the body here before. We will have to modify the content length. So I'm going to put just a placeholder here to remind us that we have to edit this because once we've written our smuggles request will work um, bottom up to to fix all the chunk sizes and the content lengths. So for our body here, we will have to define a chunk size here. And then underneath, we want to set our uh, smuggled request. So our smuggled request will be a post request for something that doesn't exist. In this case, I'm going to go with the example that I used before uh, in the presentation. So trolls 404, and then using HTTP 1.1. On the next line, we want to set a host header and a content type and a content length. So I'm just going to copy this here and paste it. Then we want to, because this is the end of our smuggled request headers, we want to set a new line to separate it from the smuggled request body. And we want to set a body with a request body parameter X for a value of one, followed by a new line. And that's it for our smuggled request, really. But we want to make sure that the front end, which is using transfer encoding chunked, forwards this entire request body onto the backend server. So to do that, we need to tell it that the request has ended. And that's with the terminating chunk at the very end. Now let's work bottom up to fix all the, the content lengths and the chunk sizes and the content length here. So for the content length, if I select the data that we have here in the request body, you can see in the selection window that it's 10 bytes in length. Now we can set the content length to 10. But that's not enough, we need to set it to at least one extra byte. So 10 plus one, um, I'm going to go with 15 instead. But the reason for that is that you need to set it 10 plus one is because you want to make sure that at least one byte of the normal request is appended to our attack request or to this prefix, this prefix here that we're poisoning the backend with. So we fix the content length, the next thing we need to fix is the chunk size right here. Because we have the terminating chunk here, we need to fix this chunk size. This chunk size, the size, it starts at the post request, and it goes all the way up to x equals one. So including the one as well, but not the carriage return line feed that comes 
right before the next chunk size, in this case, the terminating chunk. And if you look at the selection or the inspector window here to what we've selected, the hexadecimal size is A5. So I'm just going to remove this here, chunk size, and replace it with A5. And then for the content length for our actual request, if we look at it from the perspective of the backend server, which is using content length, we want it to be poisoned by this smuggled request here. That means that we have to set a content length of four, one, two, three, four, to ensure that the poisoning happens correctly and that it's just the post request um, that it's poisoned with. So I'm going to edit this and set a content length of four. That's it for our attack request. The next thing we want is a normal request. So I'm going to go back to proxy and HTTP history and send the get request for the root endpoint to repeater and then switch to repeater. And this will become our normal request. I also want to make sure that we're using HTTP 1.1. So I'm going to go back to the inspector window and downgrade it to HTTP 1.1. Just going to send this request just to show you that we get back a 200 OK. And then I'm going to go to the attack request. So this attack request is ready. Let's send it. We get back a 200 OK. Now let's follow it up with our normal request. And we get a 404 not found. And if I switch to the lab and refresh the page, you can see, congratulations, you've solved the lab. I hope this was helpful to you. And thank you for watching.